Please bear with me. Please bear with us. Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> so yeah, we'll go ahead and get started, like Tom said, and um, I think we'll be we'll be joined by more people. But um, I think we have some new people uh, with us this evening who who weren't with us yesterday. Maybe you were there on the uh, first day, uh, or maybe you. This is your first time, so I think um, we'll just start off with a small uh, review kind of quiz, a, a competitive quiz. Um, but first of all, let me just introduce ourselves again. Um, so my name is Shannon uh, Smith, and I'm an English language fellow uh, in Vijayawada, and I'm teaching at Morris Stella College here. And Tom is also here in Vijayawada. And he's a PhD researcher doing some research at the same college where I am and uh, through Lancaster University, UK. And he's also um, a training consultant uh, for British Council. So we're really happy to be with all of you uh, this evening and um, continue on a little bit from where we left off yesterday. And I think we've got a, a nice, nice plan for us today. Like I said, we'll be doing a review quiz for day one and day two, just about some of the key, uh, the key takeaways and ideas from the last two days that we were, that we've been together. Um, I'll continue on after that with uh, some thoughts, comments about visual aids and organizers. We've had um, a few uh, conversations, especially I think yesterday, but we'll get more details tonight. Then Tom's going to tell you about interactive pair and group work this evening. And also um, something really nice, I think you'll enjoy, um, asking good questions to develop critical thinking. And um, our, our session is very much aimed at um, lectures, the lecture-based classroom. So asking good questions is a, a vital part of that process. And um, we, we've got something nice lined up for you for that to get us thinking about asking good questions. And then in the last part of the evening, uh, Vicky is going to wrap up with some questions and answers and some information about the St. Joseph's College uh, Language Center and the activities that, that uh, the center runs uh, through 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 this venue, so that should be interesting for all of us as well. Okay, so we'll go ahead and start the review quiz. <laughs> now, this is a this is a multiple choice quiz, and um, most I think well maybe all all the questions have um, more than one correct answer, so it's a little bit tricky. Uh, so there's not only one correct answer, there, there might be two or three, four even. So we'll see how you do. The questions are all from topics that we discussed in day one and day two. So, and if you weren't here, it'll be good review for, or if you were here, it'll be good review. And if you weren't here, it'll be a good, uh, good catch up. Uh, there are six questions all together and, um, uh, if you if you would like to share the answer um, in the chat box, please do so. Just write A, B, C, or D, or as many as apply, and then we'll see how we do. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so we'll 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 hopefully have an active active chat box, so you can just write the letter that corresponds with your answer there. Okay. So question number one: um, Learning is a dynamic process. What does this mean? So A. Teaching should be stable and unchanging. B, teaching should be marked by activity, change, and progress. And C, teachers and students should be full of energy and new ideas. So put your answers, any that you think apply. Learning is a dynamic process. What does that mean for teachers? Just type your, your letters or series of letters in the chat box. Let's see what people say. 
we're getting bees. Bees, okay. okay. There might be more than one answer. Remember, well. yeah, there's yeah. there's more than <laughs> more than one correct answer. B and C. Okay. Vicky's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well done. Well done. Vicky's got a uh, specialized uh, <laughs> knowledge here. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, that's right. So. Uh, yes, B and C are the correct answers, and um, as we heard from Mina on day one, uh, our learning is a dynamic process. That means it's uh, forever changing. It's adaptable. We have to be adaptable as teachers, open to new ideas, and experimental. So, um, yeah, very much dynamic process and marked by change. Okay, question number two. Which of these are kinesthetic teaching strategies? And this was a term that uh, was introduced on day one. Kinesthetic teaching strategies. A, buzz groups. B, mingles. C, wall work or gallery walk. And D, pre-teaching difficult vocabulary. So which of these are kinesthetic teaching strategies? Put your letters that you think correspond in the chat. Remember, there can be more than one correct answer. There usually is. Okay, we're getting B and C again. B and C again. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, any other C? C, okay. Irene raised her hand. Go ahead, Irene. Yes, Irene. Mm, okay. Yep, C, okay. Yeah. Oh, Irene's hand's gone down, so that was a, that Sorry, was a Irene. Fa false hand, and, I think. And Irene, Harini wrote A, B, and C. Oh, A, B, and C. I okay. was thinking about that buzz groups because it was yesterday, but I was I was wondering what you're going to say, whether it's kinesthetic or not. <laughs> okay. We shall see. We, we shall see. Out. Okay. Thanks all that put your answers in the chat. Okay. Um, so, yeah, buzz groups um, is not kinesthetic uh, because there's really no movement of students or, or movement of um, resources. resources, cards, this sort of thing. Um, so that's not really a kinesthetic activity. It's a good activity, but, but not kinesthetic. Um, mingles are definitely kinesthetic. People get up and walk around the room, speak to different people. Wall work, gallery walk, the same. You have things on the walls of the classroom, maybe even different areas or stations around the room that students can walk to, take a look at, get up and stretch, so this sort of thing. Um, Pre-teaching, difficult vocabulary, not kinesthetic, but it could be, it could be, for example, if you have um, students match, for example, definitions and words in a kind of mingle way, then 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 you then you could make it kinesthetic but generally if you're just writing words up on the board um that's 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 not kinesthetic okay well done so just yeah kinesthetic means um moving things around moving the students around so um and um, some some people really enjoy learning this way and benefit from that so that that was um a nice point brought up by nina on um on day one mm. okay here's okay. question three Question three, yeah. So which, which of these are language supportive strategies for teacher or for lecturers? Excuse me, I'll say that again. Getting some feedback. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to, I was trying to mute him, but finally I got it. No worries. So which of these are lang language supportive strategies for lecturers? So we've got um, speak more slowly and clearly. B, take longer speaking turns. C, signpost important information. And D, simplify vocabulary and context. So again, if you're just joining us, we're doing a review quiz. Yes, and please post your answers that you think the letters that correspond best to answer this question in the chat. There's more than one correct answer for each question. So we've got, what do we have? So ACD seems to be a popular choice. ACD, okay. ACD, ACD. Well done all. Okay. You've clearly been paying attention the last two days. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So yeah, um, taking longer speaking turns um, might not be supportive, um, 
especially for those students who are less confident in the in the group who are already struggling with with what you're saying and i think as we spoke about last night with buzz groups buzz groups are a nice way to think about breaking your your lecture up into sections and 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 maybe helping those less confident members in the class to try to um understand what's being said so yeah the others definitely are are very um language supportive for for students in your classes and um i was going to say yeah signposting signposting is a great way to indicate to students um yes what's coming up in your talk they can even write the headings down in their notebooks ahead of time and um listen for that specific information so yeah. okay Good. Question number four. Um, why should we use a KWL chart during lectures? And uh, for those of you who uh, were not uh, with us yesterday, a KWL chart is a table that you can draw on the board, for example. And K stands for what the students know, W, what they would like to know about the topic, and L is learned after the lecture, what they've learned about the topic. So um, why would a table like this be useful during the answers? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So oh have I really? Oh dear. Okay. So to, <laughs> to find out what students know about a subject, to brainstorm what they would like to find out about the lecture, um, to encourage students to share ideas. Um, and to formally assess learning for both student and teacher. So yeah, just in the chat, write, write all that apply to this question. So we've got a, no, that oh, sorry, last one. <laughs> that's from the last one still, sorry. The screen instead of the chart. Okay, A and B, Zainab says. A and B, thank okay. you. That looks good, A, C and B. A, C and D, okay, okay, okay. any others? Thank you. Thank A you, Manish. A and C. Okay. Great. Okay. Well, in fact, um, everybody's right. <laughs> everybody's right. <laughs> Indeed. So, yeah, all of the above are good reasons um, that lectures can consider using a KWL chart during, during lectures. So, yeah, as we talked about last night, the um, predicting. Predicting um, is a powerful tool. And so if the students maybe predict what they might know about a topic uh, before you before they hear it, that's that's great. Um, also in the W section, uh, together with their group, they can think of questions that they have about a certain topic. And um, this is also a little bit uh maybe predictive what they what they would like to know and gives them a reason to listen actually to your to your talk and as we discussed last night um l the learn part is a great formative um assessment for you as a teacher and for the students too to to know what they've been able to take in uh during your talk and for you to know um what 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 they've come away with so yeah all very very useful for, for your lecture. And what it does um, work like this personalizes learning mm. for students, which is really important because often, um, you know, the curricula are, are depersonalized there um, and this involves the student in their own learning. So it takes a little bit of learner training. Uh, it may not work very well the first time um, you try it, but you know, keep keep trying, and um, and it, it's only the first five minutes of the of the class, and the last five minutes, so it doesn't have to require a long time. So it's quite a nice tool once it gets going, once mm. once it uh, it's established as a way of working with classes. Yeah, thanks for that. Mm -hmm. So good. Moving on, then right. we'll just go to question five. Question five is: What are the benefits of a buzz group style? lecture and we talked about this last night so if you weren't able to make it you'll you'll be able to catch up now um, the students collaborate to negotiate meaning the students are asked to speak in front of the class the students check if they've understood correctly the students are given time to reflect 
Again, if you're just joining us, put your answers in the chat. There's more than one ans answer to each question. So just write the letter that you think corresponds. Okay. Manish says A, B, and D, okay. A, B, and D, okay. Mm -hmm. Interesting, A, B, D, okay. There seems to be agreement with A, B, and D. A, so these B, are the benefits D. of the buzz group lecture. Okay. Mm -hmm. A, B, C, D, Irene says all of the above. Okay. All right, let's find out. Let's find out. Yes. Ah, okay, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, um, if you remember the, the buzz group, um, yeah, the students, buzz group doesn't really give uh, students an opportunity to, to speak in front of the class. What, what it does is gives the students an opportunity to talk together about a section of your lecture so that they can co-construct um, what they think they've heard. So they after you read a certain part of your lecture, you pause, you give the students an opportunity to talk together, to summarize, to co-construct, to negotiate the meaning of what you said, and um, then feedback to you and the rest of the class what, what they've heard. So yeah, it's, it's not really um, speaking in front of the class in that way. I guess, I guess if you... Um, if you nominate someone perhaps from a different, um, from, from a group, they, they, they certainly do speak in front of the class, but it's, it's not um, a kind of formal speaking in front of the class. It's, it should be um, the, the meaning negotiation and, and construction should be shared among a group of students. Yeah. Okay. Anything to add on that one? No, no, that sounds good. Irene's got her hand raised. Yeah, so let's, let's, um, let's hear from Irene. Yeah, I was in it, again. It was I. I was listening to the explanation because I was wondering why B is not. I was just you know reminded of yesterday after the buzz group, one of us was asked and we did present in front of the entire class. Yeah, that's, that's, that, why that's what I, I was saying. B. Yeah, but yeah. You know, yeah, I understood yeah, but... what it was. What was the meaning? Thank you. Yeah, the thing is, it's not really a benefit just because the students, in, in some ways, it's a, it's a it's a bit of a it's a bit of a problem uh, with buzz groups because often students are reluctant to speak in front of the class. So yeah, the idea is that students a group summarizes, um, you know, their notes, and then they might, um, you know, the lecturer might invite them to to kind of uh, do it in front of the whole group. Um, but I'm not sure if that's really a benefit. It's not it's not really designed to be um, so much. For the for the benefit of the students' speaking skills, yeah. it's more right. for the students, the other students, to to check their understanding. Mm. So, um, and in fact, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a challenge for the students to speak in front of the class. So, it might I mean you're right, it might be a benefit for their their spoken language skills from a language <laughs> teaching perspective. But yeah. in some way, it's it's a bit of both. Yeah, yeah. it's um, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Thanks, and this is our this is our final review okay. question last of the one. evening, the last one. So you still have a chance if you haven't uh, uh, put some answers in the chat box. Our last question is, um, which of these represent the the dialogic view of education? Uh, students are receivers of knowledge. A, B, students are active participants and creators of knowledge. C, interaction is between teacher and students. And D, interaction is between everyone in the classroom. So again, put the letters that you think correspond with the correct answer in the, in the chat. Dialogic view of education, something that was brought up on both days, day one and day okay, two. So B and D, mm -hmm. B and C, A, C, D. There we go. We've got quite a few uh, <laughs> different answers. We've got, we've got a, a variety. <laughs> Great. We like variety. <laughs> <laughs> test takers, test uh, markers don't like variety. Then. Okay. <laughs> okay. B, C, D, B, C, D. All right. Okay. Great. All right. So let's have a look. Okay. So, um, yeah. The dialogic view of education. Students are receivers of knowledge. It's, it's, it's definitely not A. This was, this was more of the, um, the transmission or banking style. Um, where students are like empty vessels waiting to be filled by the teacher's knowledge that the lecture will give them. And so 
yeah, this is this is what Mina referred to on day one as, as the banking style method. So definitely not that one. Students are active participants and creators of knowledge. And this um, very much applies to some activity like the buzz group lecture where they're where they're listening and co-constructing knowledge, negotiating meaning. Um, definitely not C. Um, interaction is between teacher and students. This implies that it's a one way uh, type of interaction. And um, letter D, interaction is between everyone in the classroom. So yeah, this, this implies that it's not only between teacher and student, but maybe students to students as well. So yeah. Yeah, sorry, C, C, one, C is maybe a bit confusing because mm. indeed, it, you know, interaction between everyone includes teacher and students. So maybe the word only would have clarified it, but then that would have been too easy because you wouldn't have <laughs> picked it. So. <laughs> so well done, Re really well done. Thank you. Thank you everyone that participated. That was fun. It was nice, nice to see um, what we've all, we've all been paying attention, I think. <laughs> so that's great, that's great. Okay, so um, I'd just like to, to uh, talk a few minutes about visual tools and organizers tonight. Um, and remember, we're, we're, we're talking about ways to uh, make lecture-based uh, classrooms more interactive, more motivating um, for students. And last night, um, when we were looking at the differences between our two lectures that we were highlighting, uh, Dr. Suresh and Dr. Shanti, you remember that um, Dr. Shanti had a nice visual uh, on her board of, of Florence Nightingale. She was going to lecture about Florence Nightingale. Um, so I'd just like to just do a, a, a few minutes more about visual tools and organizers, not only photographs, but other kinds of organizers that you might use in your own teaching. I'm, I'm just very curious to know what, you've, what you use, what you, um, maybe have used in the past or maybe would like to use even in the future um, in your in your lecture-based classrooms, just to get an idea. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with the expression of pictures worth a thousand words, which is actually really useful when, um, when our students um, have low English proficiency. So using visual tools is especially salient um, in a context where uh, the students struggle with English. So um, this is one of the reasons we've decided to include uh, this topic. Okay, so we've got Anita uh, saying okay. she uses flowcharts, um, echo map, um, mind map. Good, thank you, Anita. Echo map. Uh, hmm. I'm not- uh, I'm not familiar yeah. with that one. Maybe Anita. I was just gonna say, I don't know that either. So yeah, hopefully- Anita, if, you, if you wanna share that with us, that'd be great to, to um, clarify what that is. And there's yeah. uh, one doctor who has a, her hand up. Okay, yes, Dr. Alice. Or Anita. And uh, Anita, if she wants to let us know about the eco or echo map, uh, we have a raised hand. Good evening. Go. Good evening. Hello. Uh, good evening, madam. Good evening. <laughs> and we can use, uh, we use whiteboard for that. That can also be a tool, ma'am. Hmm. Use a Jamboard for the online classes. No? That's also included in these tools, ma'am. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. And uh, we use uh, small models for explaining the chemical structures. Oh, wow. hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Good. Okay, brilliant. Okay. Okay. We've nice got lots ones. of we've got lots of ideas. Flow charts, main idea map, sequence chart. Okay. So we've obviously we've got some on the, the visual here that's um, in yeah. front of you. Um, so maybe some of you use those, and some of you use different ones. The main uh, main idea map. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's great. So I think most of you are familiar with these. Oh, yeah, Anita, do you want do you want do you want to yes. share share the uh, the echo or eco? Uh, um, chart or I forget what it is. Go ahead. Eco map. Eco map. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, it's basically to do with, uh, it's a visual representation of um, a person's relation with the people around him or her. 
primarily family and even people, generally people we interact with and the kind of relationship we have. So whether it's a strong, weak, uh, mm. and which direction, it's directional as well. So it talks about each of these things. Oh, that's a, that's a, yes, yes, I know what you mean. This is a network map. Um, it's like a, it, it kind of looks like a mind map, but it's more dynamic, as we say. And it's, yeah, yeah, yeah okay, we've, um, yeah, I, we've come across, uh, yeah, so um, it's, it basically describes social networks. It's a, it's a social network map. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, very interesting, yeah. And that's basically six degrees of separation back in the past, and social networks are based on that principles like social media yeah very interesting okay great okay okay good. thank you so yeah we don't want to our, our time our clock is ticking a little bit so we okay should, okay so yeah um so um just just to um highlight i think some of the the great visual organizers that that we had on day one from from mina and ones that uh were with us last last night. So yeah, we've had we've had diagrams on day one. Mina gave us a nice diagram of Bloom's taxonomy. Um, tables. We have had the KWL chart. We discussed that in our quiz. Um, T charts. This one is called the T chart. It's shaped like a cross. Um, very useful for talking about um, benefits and challenges of different things. Maybe pros and cons if you're doing debates even something like um, differences, for example, in chemistry, the dif difference between acids and bases, for example. So many different uses for T-charts. Photographs, um, good ways of just sparking um, interest in a topic, um, getting students to think critically about a topic, maybe what's going on in a photo. Um, useful for showing people like Florence Nightingale, for example, that you're going to talk about. So yeah, different uses for photos. We've got flowcharts, really useful for describing processes, especially for, for science classes. Um, and just today, I think I used one, was, I was talking about gender uh, e equality or inequality and the different kinds of um, inequalities and, and what they led to. And when we developed the flowchart the, with the students, so many different possibilities for, for flow charts. Um, mind maps, um, and this one, <laughs> this one happens to be about content and language integrated learning. And uh, I think this was one I did with some teachers in, in Kazakhstan, but yeah, you can see how you can get a lot of different categories from mind maps. Students can build these on the boards themselves. Um, and my personal favorite, this is, this is, uh, this is one, uh, it's, it's not a drawn flow chart, but I wanted to show you this. This was developed by some teachers I was working with in, in, in Kazakhstan, chemistry teachers, and um, they made cards uh, that they wanted to give their students to see if the students could predict certain types of uh, chemical reactions. They've also developed some um, pic pictures and, and different, different things just to illustrate different lecture points that they were trying to get across. So I thought this was really nice. Um, flow charts, visual organizers don't necessarily need to be on the board or on a piece of paper, but they can be movable. And this, this turns them into a kinesthetic activity and goes a lot goes along with what Mina was telling us on day one. So it serves two purposes, actually. So that, that I thought this was quite nice. Okay. And um, one more I think we had, and Tom's going to tell you about the timeline in more detail. Okay, so something that I think is really valuable, um, and we're, we're back to Florence Nightingale <laughs> again, and Dr. Uh, Shanti, I think, is there. Um, and yeah, so timeline um, is, is a valuable tool for something like um, summarizing um, some reading, a biography that the students have read. So for example, Florence Nightingale. So, and notice what the teacher, um, what the lecture there says, what Dr. Shanti says. So she asks her students to summarize what they have learned about uh, Florence Nightingale and to make it interactive. She puts the students into groups. We'll talk about group work a little bit later. But she, she tells the group, so we're in groups, without looking at your notes or the text, make a timeline of key events in Florence Nightingale's life. 
Uh, and then she gives groups different tasks. So for example, she has half of the groups, let's say there are four groups in the class. She has a group one and two, um, put events um, on the timeline from 1820 to 1860. Mm -hmm. And then groups three and four, um, they go from 1860 to 1910. And then when they, when they do that, after they finish doing that, uh, they can get together with another group or break up into, to, into groups with people who've done the two different time frames, and they then communicate what they have written so that um, it becomes a communicative, uh, dynamic, and interactive timeline rather than just kind of filling it in. So yeah, there are, there are different things we can do with these sorts of visual organizers. It's not simply just you know put them on the board and write them out. I'm um, sure it, it certainly helps if the lecture just does it um, themselves. Um, but having the students involved in creating timelines and in um, in participating and sharing their ideas mm -hmm. is really what brings um, visual organizers to life. Um, and this is something that I think is um, you know we uh, we must reconsider when we use visual aids. I, I know all teachers do use visual aids, but they don't all use them interactively. Mm -hmm. So that's that's um, kind of the point we're trying to make. Okay. Thanks for that, Tom. So, um, yeah, so for example, I have another example here. So we've got a flow chart. This is a, this is, um, you know, a, a, a lecture in, in kind of the sciences and um, shows a, a diagram of the water cycle. So um, this is all great. Looks very nice, nice picture, nice um, clear illustrations. Um, but, you know, it could be that the students, um, they might look at it, they might forget, they might, um, they might not connect the, um, the, the, you know, with the language with the, the pictures very clearly. So um, how can we make this tool interactive? So, yeah, just I'll, I'll leave it open to you. Maybe um, if somebody wants to comment in the chat box, what can we do to make this um, visual tool more interactive? Because basically um, this is sort of the equivalent of, okay, you put it on the board, um, you might draw it on the chalkboard, there it is. Uh, you write down all of the, the, the features. Is there anything we can do to make this more learner uh, centered, more interactive? Any, any ideas? What can we do? Okay, add arrow step by step while teaching. Sure, yeah, that, that's and that's probably what teachers often do. They might elicit from the students what the different things are. Okay, okay, Vicky says use human elements. So Vicky, I do what, this, well. I do this on? with parts of speech sometime. So I, I was looking at this diagram and I was thinking, okay, so one student, you're going to be the evaporation, you're going to be the condensation. Let's put them in the right order. Of course, it does depend on the age, and we're talking mostly about higher education. So this probably my idea is more for younger people, but I thought they could have fun playing it out. Yeah, good. Okay, that sounds like that sounds great. Yeah. So something. Um, Good, ask students to describe each step. Yeah, okay, yeah. So um, you can get uh, pairs and groups to, to discuss what they see, sure. Um, aha, so Zainab um, has taken this to the next level. Thank you, Zainab. We can make part of the chat invisible, okay? And let the students guess them. All right, that's, that's quite interesting. Um, make model of the make a model of the process, Dr. Alice says. Okay, great. So some good ideas are coming in. Um, yep. Yeah. Good. Thank you, Dr. Annapurna. So um, adding adding some sort of an, a fun element to it. So I'll show you I'll show you what what I would do with it. And, and uh, maybe this is quite kind of a traditional um, lecture mode thing. But so um, this is what I've done. So I've actually covered up the the um you know the processes i've taken the words away and i've put them at the bottom so here i ask students to just put them into the into the uh, diagram yeah so where's precipitation where where does condensation go 
where's ground water, where's the surface runoff, yeah? So um, this makes it interactive. They're much more, they're, they're challenged to kind of reflect critically on this diagram. So instead of just being told the information, uh, they have to either figure it out, it could be a review uh, the next day after you've presented it, you know, so there are different ways you can um, engage students with this. But the idea is it's a simple thing and um, it can be, it makes, it provides a challenge for the student and they can do it in pairs and small groups and then, yeah, and then they can go over it. So, yeah. And um, okay, so this is a fancy PowerPoint slide, and you might be asking, well, I don't use PowerPoint. We don't have um, we don't have this facility in our college, and I know at Maristella, many of the classrooms don't have that facility. But so I was um, a few days ago, I was uh, walking um, around the campus at Maristella, and I saw a great big diagram on a on a. Uh, on a board, there was nobody in the room, so the, the the lecture had just finished, and there was nobody around. So I went and I took a photo. And this is what I found. Yeah, so this is what I saw, um, and so I, I mean, this is an IT, some sort of an IT class. Uh, I don't know anything about IT. I'm happy when I can use Zoom half correctly, and um, so what can the so. You know, you don't need fancy PowerPoint. You just need a chalk duster or an eraser, as we call them in, in Canada. So um, basically, you just do exactly the same thing as I did on PowerPoint. Yeah, very simple. Just the, the, the lecture erases, leaves the keywords um, out, and asks the students to put them in, writes them on the board, or asks them to guess. Yeah. So um, yeah, this again, it's uh, the same thing. It, it invites um, students to think critically, talk to their partners. It only takes a few minutes. So if the, if the lecture took the time to draw this, then let the students do the, the last bit of work. Yeah, and even if, they, if, if it's a guessing game, if they don't get it right, they're trying to figure out the diagram, they're trying to make sense of it, and they're much more likely to understand um, the, the visual rather than just kind of memorize it for the exam. They're, they're more engaged with the material, they're challenged by it, and they're going to gain a deeper understanding for it. So um, yeah, there, there is quite a lot we can do with visual aids, visual organi organizers, be besides just showing them or flashing them or drawing them on the board. We can make them much more dynamic. Dynamic seems to be the word of um, of the webinar series so far. Okay, um, good. D does anyone have any comments or questions about visual organizers? I believe this is um, this is um, all about visual organizers. So Anita says um, there's a better retention and recall, especially for visual learners. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm quite a visual kind of learner. I like diagrams. I like you know I I like figuring these sorts of things out. So I think um, I think a lot of students are. They like seeing visuals. Um, like I said in English, we say a pic a picture is worth a thousand words. And um, I think yeah, there's something to that visual support. I think is really valuable for many, many students. And the students who don't have English as their, as you know, as, as, uh, as, uh, as a language that they speak um, that well, who are challenged by English really um, are then, they're forced to confront the language. They can't just translate it. They really have to, you know, they have to um, confront it and deal with it. And I think that's really important because that's what they're going to get on the exam and what the, what they're going to have to deal with in their workplace. So, yeah, I, I think, um, the sort of, the sort of work is really, is really, um, yeah, it makes it, it makes it far more interesting for students and they're going to be much more engaged. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you for all the contributions. Um, so we're going to move to the next part of the. Oh, we can look at the answers. <laughs> we can, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, good. So we're going to transition a little bit to using pair and uh, group work interactively. 
Um, so a lot of teachers want to use group work, want to use pair work, um, but sometimes it doesn't go that well. And so we'll look at we'll look at um, you know some uh, one kind of common pitfall that I have come across. So um, so we go back to Dr. Suresh. Um, from who we met yesterday. And so Dr. Suresh decides he wants to try pair work. He's gonna take a big risk and he's gonna um, try pair work. And so here, here it is. And he's um, asked some students to, to, to do this kind of pair work. So here they are. Um, so in this situation, the students are sitting, um, the, the two students are standing up in front of the class. They're, they're saying something, they're presenting something. The rest of the class is sitting and listening, okay? So then we have Dr. Shanti in the next photo. And so Dr. Shanti decides to try pair work in a different way. Yeah, and this is Dr. Shanti's kind of interpretation of pair work. This is how she, this is how she does pair work. So looking at the two pictures, the two differences. Um, so um, which type of pair work do you think is more effective and why? So yeah, let's, I'll give you a chance to share in the box and we can, here are the two pictures side by side, A and B. So in picture A, we see the two students standing in front of the class in pairs, uh, presenting something. Um, and in picture B, we see um, students in pairs, uh, speaking together um, privately at the same time, yeah, um, exchanging information. Okay, so the two two very different ideas about pair work. Which, um, yeah, what what do you think? Which one do you think is more um, more effective? Uh, which one supports student learning? What do you think of these two types of pair work? Pair work A, pair work B. So just a minute to get your thoughts together and share something in the chat box. Yeah, which one do you think is more effective for students? You don't have to write why, you can just write A or B even. If you don't feel like doing a lot of typing, if you're on a phone, Okay, so Dr. Annapurna says, um, okay, I'm just, so suddenly they're coming at once. So as the students are in their comfort zone sharing uh, with each other, it's good but difficult to monitor. Dr. Suresh's way requires students to be bold to stand in front of the class. Yeah, okay. And the students might not be that comfortable with that. Um, English presents um, a challenge for students to speak um, English, as we said, is a library language. It's often called the library language in India, which means that students don't really like speaking it. They're shy. They, they're they scared to make mistakes. They're they're scared of being ridiculed. It frightens them. So they um, they prefer to, you know, read and to, um, to write instead. Yeah. Okay. And Anita says B. Um, is more effective as each student participates um, as, as against only uh, some students in picture A. Okay, so participation is much greater in picture B. B, more interaction, says um, Sri Vijaya. Okay, so picture B is popular. So Zainab says, I think A is likely because it will encourage students to, to overcome their shyness. That's right, okay. Good. All right. And B, some people like A, reinforcement makes students eager to part participate in picture A. Okay. So um, those are all really good points. And if you're, um, and it depends on the purpose of your, of your, um, your, your teaching and your activity and what the purpose of your, the aim of your session or your lesson is. So, um, I mean, from this is, this is from, from my perspective. Uh, so picture A um, shows what I what I call display pair work. So students are asked to um, to read a text or say something, and this often it's it's some sort of an elocution, which which might be helpful uh, to the students actually conducting it, delivering it. Um, 
but it often takes the form of a memorization. It isn't um, very interactive. It, um, the rest of the class, so you think of the two students who are at the front of the class, but the 30 or 40 who are sitting there. Some might be listening, others might be looking out the window, uh, others yet might be thinking about what they're gonna have for lunch. Um, you know, so the, 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 the issue there is yes, it gives students great practice and helps them overcome that um, hesitancy to speak. So if you're, if you're running some sort of an elocution or, and certainly we do, we all do that as teachers, we ask students to present, but we have to be careful because it takes a lot of time and only two people are participating. Okay, and it's really a continuation of the transmission view of learning. Um, even though it's not the teacher doing it, it's the students doing it. There's not much interactivity usually in these sorts of um, situations. So we have we can use this sort of work, but we have to understand the reason for it. Students are delivering a presentation. After that, there's a Q and A. Fine, um, but we have to be a little bit uh, careful with it. Um, as most of you uh, said, picture B represents something quite different, and we're back to our word dynamic. So picture B shows what we call closed pair work, and uh, it allows all of the students to interact. It's difficult to monitor, of course, so the students could be talking about anything. They could be also talking about what they're going to have for lunch, but often they don't. Often they interact together um, about the topic at hand. Um, it allows them to, um, to check meaning, to um, compare their ideas, um, to see if they have the same answers, whatever the case is. Uh, they're hopefully learning from each other. And if you multiply that by um, you know, 20 or 30 pairs of students, then you have a lot of learning and interaction going on at the same time. In picture A, not so much, yeah? So um, yeah, I think we have to um, think very carefully about what kind of pair work um, we are promoting, pair and group work. In this case, it's, it's pair work, okay? So just a couple of more comments from, um, Anita says a role play would need some enacting, okay, uh, while the other participants can participate by observing and responding, sure, and the teacher can moderate and ask questions. Yeah, so it depends on the situation, it depends what you're teaching, um, but most of the time when we talk about pair work, when we talk about interactive teaching, um, we are talking about um, picture B, really, yeah, pair work in that sort of manner. Um, okay, Pramila says picture A is for smaller groups. Yes, um, yes. If you only have if you have a group of six people, two people um, speaking is is great. Yeah. So um, we always have to think of how many students are participating and how many are not. Um, what if we try to enact interactive uh, teaching? Okay. So um, yeah, let's 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 continue. Um, just a brief look at the, the, the benefits of pair work and group work and why that why it might be worth a try for lectures. Um, okay, so as we said, students learn from each other, um, not just from the, the, the teacher or the lecturer. Uh, strong English users help those who struggle. Um, and there's also, uh, when, when we do this kind of pair work or group work, it it changes the hierarchical structure of, of the class. So um, they will, students will ask each other question before they'll ask the, te the teacher a question um, because they might be shy to ask the teacher out in front of everyone. But if they're, if they're um, just in a small group together, they're much more likely to say to each other, I didn't quite understand that. What did you get for question number one, what was your idea for number two? So the fact that there's not a hierarchy between the students um, or a different hierarchy, um, it, it facilitates collaborative learning and that's really valuable. So we need to nurture that in our classes. Um, so that's, that's really important. And then um, hopefully if we nurture, if we nurture this sort of, um, of collaborative learning, then we, a uh, developed sense of community among the students. And uh, this takes time to build. 
if they've never done it before, if they've never um, worked in groups before and pairs before, then they're not going to do it immediately. Um, I know when when Shannon first started teaching at the college, um, I, I on day one I, I went with her and we we put the furniture into groups and you know that was all in rows. Everybody was sitting in rows and we decided to put it into groups and. Um, when then we left waiting for the students to come in we went and then when they when they came in immediately they they, they said oh well, something's wrong with this and they they put the classroom back into rows they moved the furniture themselves back into rows so um it takes some awareness raising um learner training and really habituating the learners uh the students too learn from each other to um, to accept that as a legitimate form of learning and um, when I observe the lessons now they are they are very happy to work in groups so it really does it really does um, take some time to adjust so if you try groups and pairs and they don't work very well then um, yeah then um, don't give up on it that's that's sort of the the, the word of advice. Good. Does anyone have, um, I think that's my last point. Yep. Okay. Um, does anyone have any comments or questions about kind of pair work and group work? Any thoughts from the, from, from your end, from the participants? Okay, so the chat room is quiet. That means there are no questions. That's fine. Okay, so yeah, I mean our time is our time is going. The clock is always ticking. So, okay, so it's clear. This is great. Thank you, Doctor uh, Anupama. Yep. Sir, if we go for a pair discussion, then students will be indulging their own discussion rather than discussing the topic. I think. Ah, uh, can I? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. The practical point I'm telling you, theoretically, it's okay. It will be a beneficial and everything is okay. <laughs> yeah. more nice in class. One, one, way, one way you can keep the, the students. I would like um, to add one sorry. more thing, sir. If with the pair discussion, if you say that you give the idea and you give the final result, then it will be fine, I think. <laughs> <laughs> They'll work for yeah. the result. Otherwise, they will continue <laughs> discussing. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. Um, well, I don't know. I mean, Sh Shannon has experience with with this uh, issue of uh, discussing other things, and yeah. yeah. Um, uh, just today, I, I tried something. I think um, if you if you can prepare a kind of guide or a frame for the yeah. for the pair work, um, that's very useful. So maybe. Um, if, for example, today um, I, I, I prepared um, a frame that students, uh, they were doing a, a partner pair dictation activity and um, they had to predict words that I'd missed, I like blanked out ahead of time um, and then listen uh, for when their partner um, said those words in, in the partner dictation. And I think if you, if you, if you can use some sort of a uh, guide or frames as they're called. I think that's that's really helpful for um for keeping students on track during pair work. If you if you just say, of course, if you just say, you know, talk together, they probably won't because they, they don't have that that guide. So that's that's really important to give them, yeah, something to listen for, uh, gaps, bullet points. Uh, finishing sentences or or that yes, sort of thing. Yeah. And just to say, also, Thank pair you. work doesn't have to be. I mean, if you're if you're you know if you're teaching English, then yeah. pair work and group work <coughs> okay. form a big part of your. Mm -hmm. um, you know, pair work can be extended, and there there's quite a lot mm -hmm. of um, activities that you could do. Give them tasks. Um, if you're teaching something, um, if you're teaching a different subject. Pair work might well be just check your ideas with your partner for two minutes. Yeah. See, yes. Yeah. So it could be something very simple. So uh, getting mm -hmm. students in the habit of um, of just uh, checking a, a few um, key terminology words with each other 
things like that. So mm -hmm. just having that small group or or partner to, um, you know, just to share a quick um, ideas, answers, questions with. Um, it, it doesn't, if there's a 50 minute lecture, it might not take more than five minutes out of that lecture, but to have that interaction <clears throat> available for them and to make students feel comfortable doing it. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. okay, great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for, for the questions. This is great. Okay, good. So we're going to move on to. Thank you, sir. Yeah, my, my pleasure. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next section, which is um, which is questions and asking the right questions in terms of um, encouraging and fostering critical thinking. Uh, so, um, yeah, basically, so we're back. We're back with Dr. Suresh, and he wants to make his. his he's really coming around to interactive teaching. So, Dr. Suresh um, asks his classic question to be more interactive. So, Dr. Suresh, um, you know, there he goes. He says, "So, class, all right, everyone. How did Florence Nightingale's childhood influence her later professional life?" Okay, students, anyone, anyone. Okay, so of course the students, um, we have our confused students again, they don't know what to say. Um, they're expected to kind of answer a question and so this is, a, a, this is problematic. So Dr. Shanti asks the same question, but she asks it in a different way, okay? So she says, okay, so Florence Nightingale's childhood um, influenced her later professional life. In what way? I'll give you three minutes to, to discuss in your group, then we will share our ideas, okay? So, um, yeah. The, the, the answer might be obvious, but just, yeah, I'd like to hear from you. Why do, why do you think this approach is better? So, um, Dr. Shanti had much more success, no more confused students, okay, any, any, Any thoughts on why this approach worked so much better? Yeah, okay, thanks, Vicky. Yeah, so um, it's, I think that's the, it's, 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 it's quite obvious from the way she's done it. Um, people can see right away that um, st when students have the time to um, to share their ideas together, um, yeah, they they um, aren't going to be so confused. They can. It takes time to think about this sort of thing. So um, students um, can check their thoughts with others. They're not on the spot um, to speak right away. As we know, students don't always like to speak out. They get nervous, they get flustered, they don't know what to say. Um, they're scared to make a mistake. They think there's a right and a wrong answer. And so they, they freeze. So um, yeah, when, when they're given time, when they're given peer support, when they can negotiate meaning as we talked about, um, when they can put their thoughts together, um, they're going to be much more successful, yeah, and interactive teaching is going to go really well. So we have to think very carefully about um, how, how we ask questions and what kind of, how we expect students to answer, yeah. So um, we have a few very interesting comments. So Zainab says, of course, the second, because it gives them time to think. First one gets students confused, yeah, exactly. So it's a summary of what we've said. Okay, time-bound activity, it'll, it's everyone will be involved. Um, yeah, so it's, it's all of that. Okay, um, now let's, let's go back to this um, question, yeah? Um, in terms of critical thinking, yeah? In terms of um, what type of question is it? So um, yeah, the, how did Florence Nightingale's childhood influence her later professional life? So just, you know, a, a, the question here is a little quiz question. <clears throat> does, what, what does this question require of students? Does it require them to use their higher order or their lower order thinking skills? 
What do you think? Okay, so some people are saying B and some people are saying A. Okay, so we've got a variety of answers. B, lower order thinking skills. Okay, others say higher. So we've got a, we've got a variety of answers, A. Okay, and um, so in fact, it asks students to use their, oops, sorry. I've just done something with my screen, apologies. Okay, it asks students to use their, their higher order thinking skills, yeah? Um, so lower order thinking skills are quite factual, like um, which year did Florence Nightingale die? When was she born? What was her job? Um, those are lower order thinking skills. There's questions of fact, things that you can easily um, and quickly find in um, on Wikipedia in the first two sentences, that kind of thing. So low, lower order thinking skills are um, ones where we just have to simply um, look up factual information. A question like how did Florence Nightingale's childhood influence her later professional life requires far more um, analytical thinking. So it's a higher order thinking skill. Um, we have to think about um, her childhood, which we need to know about, and then connect that to her professional life um, and making that connection between two different parts of her life is really a higher order thinking skill. So yeah, so the answer is A. And if we're asking students higher order thinking skills, they need time to think and to uh, formulate an answer, yeah? If we ask, which year was Florence Nightingale born in? There's not much of a discussion between students. It takes, they either know it or they don't know it. But this is an answer that um, they can speculate about. They, um, they, they have various, you know, you, you can various ideas about, and there isn't necessarily a clear right or wrong answer. Okay, so this brings us to, um, to um, critical thinking and how do we work with uh, critical thinking in the classroom. Critical thinking is one of the 21st century skills which Nina, um, which Nina um, referred to on day one. So I think it's a really good idea to revisit um, this in terms of um, the way she introduced it through Bloom's taxonomy. So starting just a brief overview of this from my side, um, so Bloom's, Bloom's taxonomy, for those who haven't worked with it, is actually a model of, um, that, that highlights critical thinking skills and divides them into different categories uh, from lower order to higher order thinking skills. So we start with um, remembering something. So recalling facts, basic concepts, and things like that. So um, when was when was um, Florence Nightingale born? So something you remember, and it's easy to look up. So we start with remembering, which is kind of the lowest order thinking skills, thinking skills, oops, sorry. Then the next one is to understand, um, to explain ideas or concepts in some in more detail, to describe them. Um, to explain them a little bit. So it's still descriptive. We're still at the lower order thinking skills sort of section. Okay, the next one is applying ideas. So we're getting a little bit higher in, in what we're asking students to do. Um, we're asking them to use information in new situations. So um, we might, um, we might um, try to understand Florence Nightingale's role as a nurse, then we're applying that information. Well, um, what, how did her um, role as a nurse impact the wounded soldiers she was, she was treating? Um, so we're putting a situation to, um, uh, to the original facts that we have learned, okay? So we're asking students to apply um, some knowledge or some information Okay, sorry. Oops. Um, then we get into the higher order thinking skills. We're asking, then we ask students to analyze, to draw connections among ideas, yeah? uh, to, to talk about differences between concepts, to compare and contrast 
uh, different things um, when we talk about advantages and disadvantages. Um, yeah, we're, we're now getting into higher order thinking skills. Um, evaluate uh, goes above that. We're asking them to, um, to argue a point. So when we, when we ask students to debate, we might ask them, we're asking them to evaluate information and to form an opinion and back it up. Um, so we're asking them maybe to critique something. So this is among the highest um, uh, elements in Bloom's taxonomy. And the highest one is create, so to design um, and produce a new, um, new piece of work. Yeah. So this is um, Bloom's taxonomy. It, it dates back to the 1950s, and it's been applied quite a lot to different educational contexts. And the way that um, that I have kind of applied it is with asking questions. So um, yeah, so here we have the lower and the higher order thinking skills. Uh, lots, so L O T S are the lower order thinking skills, and H O T S or HOTS are the higher order thinking skills. So yeah. Um, okay, so. Uh, in the, I, I know my time is not is running a little bit short, but I'd like to um, just kind of persist with this. Um, so, and I'll, I'll try to do this in in the last five minutes before handing over to Vicky. I don't want to keep you too late. Um, so here, um, Dr. Shanti delivers a lecture about bananas. Okay, so she asks the class what they know about bananas. So Dr. Shanti has turned from Florence Nightingale into an uh, agribusiness uh, uh, lecture, never mind. Um, so so she, she does what um, good teachers do. She gives students time to think. She doesn't put them on the spot and so on. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then she starts her lecture. And she talks, she says there are many types of bananas in the world. The three main types are Cavendish plantain and red banana, she tells the class. They all have a long and curved shape, but are of various sizes and colors. Bananas are used, uh, are, sorry, are a healthy dessert on their own and are used in many dishes. Okay, so basic lecture, introductory lecture about bananas. Okay, and then she um, is considering appropriate questions and tasks for the class. So she makes a list of questions, so number one to six, and she is thinking, hmm, well, which kinds of, what am I asking my students to do? And so she's asking um, herself, well, which questions Am I going to ask them when? So usually when we um, ask students questions, we ask them the easiest ones first, most of the time, yeah? So we might ask them a remember question, yeah? So, from, so if we were to ask a remember question, which one would, from the lecture, which one would we ask from this one? What do we think? So if we wanted to start with a, with a question where we just ask them to remember, Which one would you do? Number three. Okay. So oh, no, no, no. I meant three types of bananas. Oh, three. Oh, right. So number two, what are three types of bananas? Yeah. Okay. So exactly. Yeah. So, so if we, if we just want students to remember, um, yeah, number two, number two is a remember question. Yes. Okay. So you get the idea. Um, I was, I'm going to, I was going to do this in a breakout room, but I won't because of time constraints. So I'll just, I'll just um, go over the questions with you in each of the categories. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm sorry about that. I was hoping to do a breakout room. Um, so yeah. So question number two, what are three types of bananas is a, is a, is a good remember question. So the next level up is understand. So then she might ask something like, what are the similarities and differences between types of banana? Yeah. So she's, so the, that was, um, that requires a, a, a deeper understanding rather than just naming and remembering something. It's something that she lectured about, the students have to really understand it a little bit more. So some are, you know, different shapes, different um, different colors and so on, yeah. So they, they gain a deeper understanding. 
Okay, so applying, um, then they're asked um, to apply their knowledge about bananas. So this wasn't necessarily talked about in the lecture, but they have to apply their knowledge to a new situation. So what are four dishes which contain bananas? So they might have to use their background knowledge or look up this sort of information. Okay, then when we ask them to analyze, we might ask them, we might ask them to put, put the dishes that they found in order from most healthy to least healthy, yeah? So then they have to analyze those banana dishes, which ones are healthy, which ones are unhealthy, and to rank them into to, to most to least healthy. So they're really being asked to use their analytical skills, uh, look at the sugar contents, the, the, the butter contents, and to assess those and analyze the, the dishes. Yeah? So evaluating might ask them to do something like, uh, usually why questions, why are many banana dishes unhealthy, yeah? Why is it that so many banana dishes are unhealthy? And then they can get into um, the, the contents, um, you know, the different ingredients and the preservatives that many of them have and so on, um, the sugars, the fats, and, and all the rest. Um, and finally, um, we might ask students to create something um, so writing a recipe for a healthy new banana dish, for example, okay? So this is a very simplified, illustrative example of, of um, how we could reflect on our questions and what we are actually asking students to do using Bloom's model, Bloom's taxonomy. So, um, yeah, I, I don't want to. I don't want to kind of go on anymore. I'd like to invite you uh, to ask any questions or share your thoughts about asking these sorts of questions and deciding what we're actually asking students to do. Um, Can I add one thing to the Bloom's taxonomy? Sure, go ahead, Vicky. Yeah, this is so good, Tom. And what I find is that there's so many teachers who are not using this for their objective and their assessment. And so they're, they're maybe um, assessing them on the level of remembering, but um, their objective was for them to create something. And so this really helps with the objective and assessment matching also. And so I just wanted to add that. This, and these questions really help to, to see that. Excellent. Yeah, no, I think, I think it's something that Teachers, need, teachers of all levels, um, including in higher, and especially in higher education, um, really need to be aware of, and what are we actually asking our students to do? What thought process are we demanding of them? And how much are we challenging them? When do we ask these questions? For example, if we want to um, ask them about, um, you know, if we want to elicit their, um, you know, their, their, uh, the background to something, we could ask a higher order thinking skills questions if we give them time for a discussion to set the context. So for example, for the Florence Nightingale um, introduction, we said, well, what were, what were women, what were professional women's status in the 1860s compared to now? I mean, that's kind of a, a question of uh, analyzing or applying um, their understanding of what women's roles were in 1860s compared to now, but it sets the stage nicely for, you know, for the, for the novel, for, for the biography of Florence Nightingale. So, but we should really be aware of what we're asking our students to do so that, um, yeah, so that we know how much we're challenging them, how much time to give them for the task and, um, and so on and how we're evaluating them. So, yeah. Yeah. All Good. Right. Any other other thoughts? Yeah. Any other thoughts and questions for Tom? So we um, or, okay. or you can even ask about the visual tools, all of the different um, organizers that we talked about. Um, sure. So I'm just going to skip ahead. All these slides will be available to you, but I'm going to so I'm going to finish my my um, and Shannon has gone to her other meeting now, but I'd like to yeah just say a final thank you and invite my, my slides now and um here are some references just a few academic references i've tried to keep it as kind of practical as possible uh but it's all there and, and um, i will pass on i've made i've made a few changes vicky so i'll pass on the latest one to you and i'll share these 
um, as a PDF or however you want to share it. So anyways, thank you very much. And over to Vicky to lead the question and answer session. And I'm sorry if I've gone a little bit over time. No, you're fine, but could you stop the share? Yeah, there we go. Okay, so yeah. um, so I, I do wanna give time for, for questions. I don't wanna, I, I really want to talk to you about a little bit about the Language Center. Um, and I and I will give you the feedback form in just a short while, but I want to open it up for any questions for Tom first. You may raise your hand, you may unmute, or you may put it in the chat. There is something in the chat and I didn't see what it is. Let me see if it's a question. Ah, Daniel Vatabu. Okay. Um, Uh, Anita shared, uh, reminds me of school and university times when we used to have questions starting with evaluate and analyze. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Bloom's taxonomy is very tough to implement in our semester and exams, sir. Why, why is that, Anupama? Why is, why is it difficult to implement? Okay. Well, well, okay, well, we'll wait for Dr. Anupana to, to join us if, if, if they want. But um, yeah, I think I, it's not so much, I wouldn't worry too much about implementing it for exams, really, because exams require, are, are often given and I don't think we have much choice on what we ask on exams, right. um, if, unless you're the, it depends on the exam. I mean, I think you can, if you're an exam writer, and a good designer, then of course these are important questions, whether we're asking students just to memorize something or whether we're asking them to, to more deeply understand or analyze something. But it's it's also more about the questions we ask our students during lectures, yeah, and tasks we give them to um, contribute to their understanding and to um, their learning. So it's it's not so much about testing them or assessing them as as it is about uh, adding that element to and reflecting on the questions that we formulate in class to uh, invite them to think about the concepts we are introducing. So yeah, it's um, it's less for assessment for most teachers. Yeah. Okay, uh, Dr. Alice said that they use the revised blooms. I think that that's what you used also. That was the revised blooms. Um, also. Yeah, there have been different, a yeah. couple of different versions, yeah. Just understanding the lower cognitive level and the higher is what's most important. Yeah, I, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much about the categories because they can be confusing. And I've asked students to put them or, you know, teacher or trainees to put them into the right categories. It's sometimes tricky. The difference between analyzing and evaluating isn't always clear. So I wouldn't worry about it so exactly, but I, I would think about the two, especially the two categories, higher order or lower order thinking skills. In general, are we asking our students to kind of create something, analyze something more deeply, or is it simply uh, just to remember or, or yeah. understand something? So I, would, I wouldn't worry too much about those specific categories as the principle of kind of higher and lower order yeah, thinking. I, so. I, I totally agree. Yeah. Um, and if uh, any of you want to talk to me more about that, I'm going to talk to I'm going to tell you in a moment about our teacher forum, and we can certainly have more discussion about uh, blooms. Um, uh, we would like at least one picture of our webinar. And so um, if I before I talk before I give you a couple of uh, resources and things, I would like to ask you to put your video on for 15 seconds so that we could uh, take a picture of all of you with us and uh, Tom for at least one final picture, please, please, for our website. Okay, Narinda, I would love to see your face. Narinda, I met in, there she is. I met her in Chandigarh. Hi. Okay, a few more uh, pictures, please, before I snap the screenshot. 
don't worry, your names won't be under your, at least when I do a screenshot, the names go away. So um, maybe uh, Anita, hers, the, the names stay on it. So she'll do one too. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and count to three and then I will uh, snap, okay? One, two, three. Anita, did you get one? Okay, I got one too. All right, so let me have five more minutes. We have seven there, minutes total. If I yeah, could Pekinka, have- there's, there's just one more question, if you don't mind. Um, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. There was a post-COVID semesters are too short, says uh, Joshna Jay-Z. And our, uh, oh, I was, that was a direct message to me. So maybe I'm, I'm the only one who got it. Sorry, I'm not, um, I thought it was to everyone, but I guess I, I have it only on my screen. Uh, is too short and demands teachers to teach and conduct revisions and te uh, tests at the end. How advisable is this? I mean, I, my feeling is that um, we have to live with our circumstances as they are. And um, yeah, semesters are short, um, and classes are short. It's, uh, and we have to, but revisions, for example, are really a great time to be interactive. But there's no better. Um, time to enact interactive teaching than during revisions. Uh, revisions should really be from the bottom up, from the student side and up. So thank you, Joshua and Jay-Z for that question. Yeah. Okay, sorry, Vicky, go okay, ahead. I didn't no, want that's to okay. more people. I'm gonna hold off on giving the feedback form. So I have a, a little audience to share about the Language Center because the SJC Language Center, which is one of the sponsors of this webinar, um, is open to anyone and everyone, students and teachers. So I wanna just tell you a little bit about it and uh, it won't take long. So my closing comments here, I went ahead and put everything on a slide so that I wouldn't, uh, so that I wouldn't rattle on <laughs> about anything. Okay, so um, once again, uh, thank you all for attending this three-day international webinar with Mina, Shannon, Tom, and I. Okay, so the SJC Language Center is available, as I said, to everyone. Uh, right now, we are not offering classes for languages, but we are offering all kinds of practice for languages. So these are a couple of shots of, you can see, here's our schedule for the month. Let me just show you real quickly our website. Can you all see the screen, the website? Okay, so it has a little bit of a different heading right now because we're advertising our uh, webinar. And over here, we're advertising our professional perspectives, which we have every Monday where we're interviewing people in different professions from around the world for uh, aspiring graduates and people beginning their careers. So if you look at the top here, uh, you can, you can go to our website. I'm not going to take you through it all, but it has uh, pictures of our team, our clusters, and this means our activities. We have four different conversation clubs, actually five. We have two English, one Spanish, one French, and one Hindi. And um, we have reader theater, debate club, grammar brush ups. We have a tutoring initiative. So if any of you have students who really need to have some one on one help, uh, from a, a graduate student or from a, a professional teacher such as myself, they can apply for one time a week, free tutoring, one-on-one, uh, -on -one. okay? Here's our gallery where you can see, uh, you'll see uh, the, this, the lectures from this webinar will be here. This is where our uh, interviews are with our professionals, uh, creative writing class that we had with a published author, and then question and answers. And here's uh, something new that I, I'm going to mention to you. The teacher forum is a community of practice that we have begun. And I just put a new topic on there today, interactive lecture. So um, these are places where you can pose questions, respond to questions, and um, we're just trying to get this started. There's a question about icebreakers and um, interaction online. So, but you can also uh, create a post and ask a question and get discussion. So we want to try to create a community 
of teachers who sometimes we just need somebody to ask a, a question to. All right. So um, that is um, that is the website. And um, I want to encourage you to go to the website. When you go to the website, uh, this is the website address down here. When you go there, so when you scroll to the bottom, you'll see a subscription form. And if you sign up for that subscription form, what you're going to get is an email or a WhatsApp message once a week uh, or on the day of the lecture or the, the activity, uh, you'll get a reminder and you'll get the link for that activity. Uh, so just fill in the required details, click subscribe, or you can just uh, go to the WhatsApp and uh, subscribe in that way, whichever way you like to get your reminders. Okay, this is a little flyer about our tutoring initiative. We are right now taking applications for volunteer tutors, as well as students who need tutoring. So what uh, we ask you to do there is to write our, our um, email address for an application, and we will send you uh, an application for tutoring or to become a tutor. We're always needing professionals. All you have to do is donate about an hour a week, more if you have it. Um, but it's a really great way of, of helping people with their, their English or Hindi. We also have some Hindi um, tutors. Uh, so I already talked about the uh, teacher forum, but uh, Salishma made this nice little um, uh, flow chart, I guess Tom would call it, <laughs> of how to uh, how to begin to be a part of the teacher forum. So you go to the when you go to the website, this is on the first page there. So you don't have to you can take a picture of it, but you'll find it on our website, how to log in, sign up and become a part of this community and get us all talking to one another and sharing ideas and support. Um, it's only for teachers. All right, this is our brochure. If you would like for me to send you our brochure, it gives you our, the names of all of our clusters, our current special series, our special service, um, and our website and email address. So if you would like a copy of this brochure, I'll be happy to send it to you. And uh, this is actually, um, I put Mina's references, Tom's references, and a couple of other resources that I uh, wanted to share with you. One was about teaching in large classrooms. I found it a great article. So um, I can send this to you. Um, it really gave me some good ideas about how to engage students in larger classrooms. And then the second is an, a, it's a couple year old article, but it's about uh, remote uh, professional learning. So uh, this particular slide has uh, all of those resources there for you. So, well, I went a minute over. So now I'm going to put in the chat and, and you guys can ask me any questions while people are clicking on the chat or copying the link. Here is the uh, form, the Google form. Um, and as you know, I will put the names all together and uh, please give me a couple of days. I'll be doing this uh, on my own. I'll, I'll work on it, putting your names on the certificate that we have designed and uh, sending that to you. And you're so welcome. Thank you for the thank you. And are, are there any last minute questions about the language center, um, the, the webinar, Tom and Shannon, Mina, me, you know, I'm open to every question except the age thing. I don't answer the age thing. No? All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, uh, please uh, stay connected. If you need any information, just send me an email. Uh, or a WhatsApp message, and uh, I will get back to you with whatever it is that, that you might need. Thank you all so very much. Um, it really has been, I, I don't know, just a great blessing, but a real uh, learning experience. I learned something new. I always learn something new from different people. Uh, Tom is also saying thank you.
to everyone. We're so we're so glad that you came. And uh, your email is on the Google form, so that's uh, how you will get your certificate from me in a day or so, day or two or three, but soon. All right, thank you all. Good night. And um, again, we're very appreciative. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. Anita, send me Anita, send me your picture with the names because I don't know when I do the screenshot, it always takes away the pictures on mine. I mean, the names on mine. So, all right. Appreciate everyone.